Tonight on Love Live at 6, internal rumblings are being heard as the city council looks to hire a new city administrator. We'll tell you who wants in. Bejerano says he is being evicted from his land in the deep south, but was he lying? We'll bring you another version of this story. Works on the Joe Taylor Bridge and the alternate route into Punta Gorda are well underway. Social Investment Fund breaks ground for a pre-primary school in Gales Point. And there are new laws under the PUC that will bring new fees for energy consumption and solar panels. We've got details of these stories and much more after the break. Stay with us. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay it. You can also pay it with your phone. I need to go to Positive Baby Series B. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make a transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank. Building the future together. This plan. Can't this plan. Smart hey there, smart thinkers. We're turbocharging your mobile experience with Smart's powered up postpaid plan. Imagine a world where your data speeds flows faster than ever. Well, guess what? We've cranked up the dial and unleashed the postpaid power of Smart's lightning fast LTE data on all our postpaid plans. That's right, no speed bumps, more data. It's like having a limitless highway of data speed at your fingertips. Whether you're a lone ranger with an individual plan or a squad rolling with a group plan, everyone gets to surf, stream, and share at enhanced full high quality speed. Switch to Smart's powered up postpaid plans today and ride the wave of postpaid power. Visit any smart showroom or smart-bz.com for details and make your mobile experience smarter and faster. Smart, bringing people together. I know I can't let this plan. I can't let this plan. at the Belize Earth Day at Creatively Green Pop-Up happening at the Memorial Park on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop from a wide selection of eco-friendly boots, light, soil handmade clay jewelry, Hello Body Belize, Naturally Belize Cosmetics, Belize Eco Bag, 
Zero Belize, and so much more. Enjoy delectable food and beverages from Don Ceviche, Iguana Stop, Brain Freeze Margaritas, just to name a few. Live performances by QB and Band, Britney Star, and Yes Talia. For more details, call us at 227-2420. The Belize Earth Day Pop-Up is brought to you by the Belize Tourism Board in partnership with the Belize City Council. Sponsors include DigiWallet, Coca-Cola, and the Belize Waste Control Limited. See you on April 20th at the Memorial Park. Belize City, are you ready again? It's B-E-B-L Basketball. It's all happening on Sunday, April 14th, inside the Belize Civic Center. Come on, witness the Tiger Sharks versus Clem upon Georgian. Always great. That's why I like to pick the about there. Bring out the entire family this Sunday, Belize Civic Center. Doors open at 4 p.m. and game starts at 6 p.m. Music, food, drinks, and giveaways. Big giveaways at the halftime. San Pedro Tiger Sharks versus Clem upon Georgian. It's all happening on Sunday, April 14th, inside the Belize Civic Center. Doors open at 4 p.m. and game starts at 6 p.m. After party will be at Reggae Sundays at Thursday, Thursday. Sponsors are Real Man. Good evening and welcome to Love Live at 6 with your news for tonight. I am Tamar Jones. Three persons were interviewed today at the City Hall as the Council seeks to hire a new City Administrator. It is a major position that was held by the late Stephanie Lindo Garbot and that the Council received three applications of interest for. Among the three are stalwart PUPs, namely the party's Secretary General Linsford Castillo and former PUP councillor Albert Vaughan. Love News understands that a line has been drawn within the PUP as Castillo is a recently returned PUP, while Vaughan has been embedded in the Freetown camp with Francis Fonseca for decades, even during opposition. Be that as it may, however, the selection process has placed Mayor Bernard Wagner in quite the quagmire. As if the selection was not difficult enough, Mayor Wagner was also forced to deal with a joint letter from his 10 councillors asking that they have a seat at the table when selecting a new city administrator. The letter is dated April 9, and it notes in part, and we quote, It has come to our attention that the selection committee for the post of city administrator includes only one council member. The City Council Act Part 3, Section 13, Subsection 1, clearly states that the council shall appoint a suitable qualified person as a city administrator who shall be responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs of the council. As per the norm, we are therefore requesting that all council members who wish to be a part of this election committee be appointed, end quote. Well, that request to the mayor was dead on arrival, as the mayor responded, reminding and informing the councillors that the City Council Act refers to a clear separation of administrative and executive duties. He made it clear that the councillor's role is that of executive, while he, the mayor, is the administrator. Is it as it relates to the interview process, Wagner wrote in his response, and we quote, The interviewing committee serves at the purview of the mayor and encompasses senior administrative personnel from our Human Resources Department, Finance, and from the office of the mayor. May I remind you that I am the only personnel that serves in both capacities and HR functions fall under my purview. The executive arm or caucus will then debate the recommendations of the committee and therefore, or thereafter, the chair will then put the question. It is there that you debate the merits and the recommendation. That is the role of the executive arm of the council. I am disappointed in you, referring to Javier Castellanos, as a senior councillor, as well as the deputy mayor, and all those who are serving their second term. I will excuse the new councillors on the basis of ignorance and misguidance. Please be guided accordingly. The committee remains as is. End of quote. It is to be noted that the letter sent to the mayor had the signatures of six of the ten councillors, namely 
Alan Pollard, Stephanie Hamilton, Dorian Usher, Javier Castellanos, Sherwin Garcia, and Evan Thompson. John Bejerano has gone on public record indicating that he is being evicted from land in the South that belongs to him. He noted in his report that it is the Belize Defense Force that has served him the notice of eviction and that he has the land documents to prove ownership. That is his side of the story, he told to PGTV. In another version of the story, Love News has learned that Bejerano has no valid land documents to prove ownership. He claims that the notice from the Commissioner of Lands came as a surprise because he had never had any issues before. For context, here's Bejerano's version of what took place. The BDF was gone there and then tell women could draw from there, we could move. You know, one mountain, you know, they born up the house, the touch house where you could see it on the picture. And they said, we have to go. So I we complain about it, you know, because we did a long time, my father, from Judge Price time. Before we, Belize became before independent. Became independent. We did a other day ban the first time we found it. So I don't know why we have to move from there. So we did try if that would be the case, if we have to get two lawyers, we are getting because we could find the money we fight for we right. We spoke to the um, Alcalde from Graham Creek and Machakila and then said they okay, no problem, then welcome to the village and we, we they under um, Graham Creek village and then say we BDF can, cannot come and draw away from the for we land, you know. So But you were there before Graham before Creek existed. Exists, yes. And sir. before Machakila existed. Same thing. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Your father had a farm up there. Yeah, yeah. And now you are on the farm. What do you have on the farm today? We got one big touch house, about two buildings. And we have a um, plantation. We got corn. We have both about 50 acres with corn right now. And planting banana, all kind of plants. The adage goes, there are always two sides to a story. Today, our newsroom spoke to the BDF's general, as Zariel Loria, about the ordeal. Loria informed our newsroom that Bejerano does not live on the property, but has several workers occupying attached structures built on the land. Loria says Bejerano is not being truthful and explained that apart from a coca plantation found in the area, Bejerano is lacking the proper paperwork. About two to three years ago, um, one gentleman known as Mr. Pejarano started construct, um, doing farm work um, at the Sarstone River Bank, going towards the um, Grasses Adios Monument, uh, halfway through the Sarstone. Uh, he was told that he was illegally um, conducting farming in that area. At that there is Crown Land, but he, and, but he never desisted. He, said that he was going to continue build anyways uh, because he has he has land papers we um and he provided some of the land papers that, that he had at the time so that we gave it to the to the police and the land department to cross check when they cross check um that leaves that they should uh, belong somewhere else along the the, the i think it's the Tamash river there, there about. I'm not, I'm not too sure, but he did. But the land, the, the the paper that he provided for that land itself, that, that area that he was clearing, was not where the it was, it was meant to be. And plus, the the lease paper was already expired for the area that he had in the, uh, in the Tamash. I believe it is, is somewhere in the Tamash. Um, in that area, not too far from that area, about two or three kilometers um, going in towards uh, Graham Creek. We, that is the area where we discovered the coca plantation. And we were simply, tell, um, we, we were simply telling him that please do this. We consulted with, with the Minister, uh, Ministry of um, Natural Resources and the police. They found out that, um, that he did not have... Um, any such documentation to, to claim that land, that piece of land. 
Loria added that it was the police that provided Beherano with the eviction notice to vacate the premises within 30 days. Last month, the government approved new legislation geared at modernizing and putting in place safety guidelines to standardize Belize's energy sector. On March 4, the Ministry of Public Utilities and Energy ratified the new electricity licensing and consent by way of statutory instrument SI-39. The legislation, according to the PUC, seeks to modify the existing regulatory environment for electricity supply, transmission, distribution, and energy storage. Many of the provisions under the new law may have slipped many Belizeans who will be affected. So tonight, reporter Vijay Alvarez breaks down the new law. If you're one of the few dozens of people who use solar to power your home or business, you may now need to obtain a license to do so. The Public Utilities Commission, PUC, has implemented new laws that will govern the transformation of the country's energy sector. Under the new statutory instrument, the Commission has expanded the number of licenses required to take part in the supply, transmission, distribution and sale of energy. PUC's Director of Tariff Standards and Compliance, Ernesto Gomez, spoke about the overall goal. Many people are going forward and installing their own generation at their homes via solar panels or small little wind turbines. And we find out that the old legislation did not give the powers to the PUC to license them and to bring them into the system. The PUC's three category of licenses have now been expanded to 15 different licenses, which range from $100 to $10,000 in cost. The categories cover a range of people, from those generating just enough energy for their homes to persons seeking to construct industrial wind, solar, or biofuel plants. Meanwhile, persons producing below a certain threshold will only be required to register with the PUC. The, what we call the small, the, the small um, installations, uh, the installations um, be, be below 3 kilowatts, um, which is 300 watts, um, they, they, they're not required a license. They're required to register, and they're required that BEL does an inspection that their technical equipment is to standard and will not burn or, or anything like that. And with the changes comes a new way of calculating a person's energy bill if they're producing energy. The PUC is now revising its tariff structure to create a more equitable way of charging residents who are both consumers and producers. Well, the tariff needs to be able to reflect that, that, you know, they pay the, the right price for the energy, pay for the infrastructure that they use as a demand charge, and also pay a fixed charge for the fixed type of, of transactions that are done, for example, the production of an electricity bill and stuff like that. And also, they get paid for any generation that they produce in excess and is fed into the grid. So the new tariff, a new tariff has to be developed to be able to cover these types of activity. It is common around the world. It's being implemented everywhere. Another major change will be the introduction of demand rate, which will vary based on an individual's peak consumption rate. The Belize Electricity Limited has already begun installing smart meters, which track the usage and will aid in determining the charge, according to Gomez. It's a little bit more fair because right now, we just lump everything into per kilowatt hour. So you'll be paying the same portion as anybody else um, on the per kilowatt hour unit. While in this case, it will be basically your demand. If you happen to be fanatic of electronics and all types of electricity gadgets, you know, air fryers and microwaves and all that, well, you're going to be demanding more and you'll be paying more. So it's just fair that we levelize the playing field and let the, the persons pay as they need. Persons who produce excess energy can sell that power to BEL. However, they will not be collecting cash. Gomez explained that the payment would be calculated as an avoided cost and be deducted from the person's electricity bill. In the case of Belize, uh, you will avoid the diesel engines, you will avoid the, the, um, the heavy fuel oil, and you will probably avoid Mexico. 
because everything that is produced by the sugar industries we buy because obviously you cannot stop the production of sugar um, and everything that passes to the hydro uh, we buy so as a result when we add up those three ones that are being avoided it, it come up with an average rate and that's the rate that the people that are feeding in will get paid it is almost equivalent to the average cost of power uh, right now the average cost of power is about 25 cents the regulation also encompasses several other guidelines and guardrails to ensure the energy sector can evolve by leaps and bounds while protecting all involved the most important part is safety and as a result there is a set of regulations for interconnection that will set out the safety part of it um, to make sure that um, the person producing it is safe and the, whatever he's injecting into the grid is also safe for the workers of BEL and for the other consumers that are close to, to that person. Under the new regulations, persons who currently conduct electricity activities above a certain threshold without a license are required to apply for one no later than six months after the regulations came into effect. Vigil Alvarez, Love News. In other news from the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC, the Commission is currently reviewing Belize Electricity Limited's 2024 to 2028 full tariff review proceeding application. The company applied for the PUC's review of the document for September 2024 to June 2028, which contained four major proposals. The company has requested for rates to remain the same throughout the coming years and says its proposal addresses the recovery of balances from previous periods arising from differences between the actual costs incurred and revenues collected. PUC's Director of Tariffs, Standards and Compliance, Ernesto Gomez, explained that the process will take a couple of weeks to be completed. The BEL made a submission on the 22nd of March, and the PUC has 45 days to go through it, analyze it, and come up with an initial decision. I think that puts up to the 5th of May, 8th of May, something like that. So at that time, um, the PUC will come up with an initial decision made by the commissioners and will then will be put out for public consultation. So right right now, it's, it's the technicians going through the details, spreadsheet by spreadsheet, and looking at the numbers, looking at the forecast, looking at how BEL plans to dispatch, how, how they're going to spend. So right now, it is that moment where we're going through all the mathematics and assumptions and what have you. So, so myself heading the operation don't have any kind of indication on how it will go until we put everything together. The FTRP is on the website for the public to see okay. uh, because it's a public information. And in the FTRP, BEL requests that the rate be kept the same even though they recognize that there are going to be some um, um, revenue requirements that will not be met, but for the purpose of stability, they are requesting that the PUC keeps the rate the same. We cannot lean on any of the sides of the decision. We have to go down to the numbers. The proposal also includes the introduction of new tariffs and prices for electric vehicle charging, distribut distributed generation, and tourism customers. On March 8, seasoned defense attorney Oscar Silgado was convicted of abetment to commit murder in the Belize High Court. Several prominent attorneys have commented on the verdict, calling the matter unprecedented for the legal profession in Belize. And while the court has set the month of July for his sentencing hearing, Selgado, wasting, Selgado wasted no time in filing an appeal which, with support from his colleagues at the Association of Defense Attorneys. Attorney Michelle Trapp says she won't be the one to defend Selgado in court, but she is a member of the team and has read the judgment handed down by Justice Nigel Pilgrim as many as four times. Trapp says that the official transcripts have not been released for the trial, but based on the judgment, she feels that Silgado did not have a fair trial for several reasons. 
One of those reasons was the admission into evidence of the witness statement by Giovanni Ramirez, the man who told police Salgado hired him to kill Marilyn Barnes back in 2019. The statement was allowed on the grounds that Ramirez claimed to be in fear that Salgado would have him killed. Attorney Trapp says that admitting just Ramirez's statement as evidence means that he could not be cross-examined. When that was done, what it meant for the defense is that they would not have been in a position to cross-examine Mr. Ramirez. In particular, not in a position to cross-examine Mr. Ramirez as it relates to whether or not what he said in his statement that he claimed to be on truth. He said he untruthfully told Oscar Salgado that his girlfriend, who is who he said is Chester Williams' niece, heard one of the recordings that he made of this conversation he and Oscar was having in regards to the plot to kill Miss Marlene Barnes. So no cross-examination took place, which means no opportunity to cross-examine on whether or not that it's true or not, and what, what of that statement is true, that he has a girlfriend, if that is true or not, that the, if you have a girlfriend, if the girlfriend is Chester's niece for real, or that the girlfriend listened to the video. So it, to me, that was a bit um, ambiguous as it to what is the untruth in that statement. Trav added that the admission of the statement without the ability to cross-examine the witness raises questions about the, authentic the authenticity of the recording itself. I also want to say why I believe it was um, he had never had a fair trial. Given the fact that if you're going to record a conver telephone conversation, you would have known that ahead of time. Uh, no ahead of time to ensure that the whole process was fair, fair to all parties. I'm saying that to mean that no JP was present to ensure that these recordings came about by authentic means, that it wasn't a performance from Mr. Ramirez, that there was no stop, wait, say it again kind of thing when you're doing, a, when you're recording. And there wasn't any presence or involvement of defense counsel not to question but just certainly to just sit back and listen to ensure that the process of this recording the importance of that recording was because given his him being adamant that he's not going to come to court and testify because he's fearful for his life which the court accepted uh, and and allowed the statement to be tendered meant that defense counsel would not be in a position to cross-examine him. But it also meant that defense counsel can't, is not in a position to say whether or not these three recordings that led to the statement being admissible into evidence were done by just a natural, natural phone conversation and there wasn't any prompting Trapp said she spoke to Selgado as recently as last week, and at the time, he had still not received the trial transcripts. We'll keep following this story. In an ironic twist, while Selgado is in prison awaiting the transcripts of his trial, the key witness in the matter, Giovanni Ramirez, has also ended up in jail. Ramirez was picked up under the state of emergency late last month. While he had escaped the initial raids, Commissioner of Police Chester Williams confirmed this evening that Ramirez is behind bars. One of Salgado's supporters and colleague, attorney Michelle Trapp of the Association of Defense Attorneys, also weighed in on Ramirez being wanted by police, saying that it came as no surprise to her. On the issue as it relates to this wanted poster that I've seen being circulated with regards to police wanting Mr. Giovanni Ramirez in the context of Oscar Salgado's case. Let it be known that Ramirez stood before the court as a person of bad character because the testimony from Chester Williams, the commissioner of police, was that he's a gang affiliate. He's an affiliate of a criminal gang. Um, he had a previous um, conviction for dishonesty, handling stolen property, stolen goods, and that um, there was also the issue of what he said in the statement that he never planned to kill anybody. He just made a 
bribe Oscar basically, get money from Oscar over and over, but he never intended to kill anybody. So he, he basically said that in his statement as it relates to that. And so it's no surprise then that there would be a, a, a wanted poster out for him because he is a person of bad character. The commissioner himself said it in, in, in open court. Ramirez appears in our news archives several times, including an incident for an unlicensed firearm, which is said to have been the reason he crossed paths with Salgado. And more recently, he had been knocked down and stabbed in the Lee City. Ground was broken this morning in Gales Point, Manatee, for a new pre-primary school in the village. The groundbreaking spearheaded by the Social Investment Fund, SIF, was done this morning on the school grounds. At the ceremony, the executive director of SIF, Carlos Tun, gave a detailed breakdown of what village residents can expect when the project is completed, including a new pre-primary school. Early childhood education is so very, very important. Early childhood education. The quicker we can get them into school, the better. And the better country we will have when we have that preschool education from age two or three and bringing the children. And you know something? There's, there's a saying that sometimes says you build it and they will come. Well, we will build this new preschool and I'm sure this transformative project is valued at 1.15 million billion dollars and represent a significant investment in the future of education within Gales Point, but also neighboring communities. The financing for this endeavor stems from the education and human development sector of the Basic Need Trust Fund BNTF 10 grant program with contributions from esteemed partners, including the Caribbean Development Bank, the government of Belize, and the supportive community of Gales Point, Manatee. Together, we are committed to uplifting the educational landscape for the benefit of our young children, extending our reach to neighboring communities such as Mullins River. One cornerstone of this project is the construction of a preschool building, meticulously designed to meet the standards outlined by the International Building Code and the Ministry of Education, Culture, Science, and Technology. Spanning 1,600 square feet, this facility will feature an open classroom, a kitchenette, storage facilities, restroom for students and teachers, a shower facility, and a covered veranda. Embracing inclusivity, we'll install an access ramp for individuals with physical disabilities, Very good. Very good. ensuring that every child has an equal access to education. Furthermore, the preschool will be outfitted with essential furniture, preschool toys and equipment, creating an enriching learning environment for our young leaders. Surrounding the compound, a chain link, chain link fence will provide security and peace of mind for both students and staff. Additionally, our efforts extend to the rehabilitation of the existing primary school building. This comprehensive endeavor includes the refurbishment of the roof, electrical upgrades, installation of modern amenities such as whiteboards and bathroom annex and the provision of hurricane resistant windows and doors. Present at the ceremony was Minister of Human Development Dolores Baldaramos Garcia who spoke on the importance of the project and other projects like it to improving the quality of early childhood education in Belize. Early childhood education is so very very important early childhood education the quicker we can get them into school the better and the better country we will have when we have that preschool education from age two or three and bringing the children and you know something there's, there's a saying that sometimes says you build it and they will come well we will build this new preschool and i'm sure the children will come because the, Jason said at one time it was only two or three or four. But I am sure when people see the beautiful facility and when the parents realize that the excellent infrastructure will provide a space for our children to grow, that is when I think they will come. And our school will grow, our Gales Point Manatee Government School with the preschool will grow from strength to strength and provide our children with the future 
that is so important. And I have always said, you know, that Gales Point is a very special place. It is a very, very special place historically in our country, uh, Belize. We are living in a good country, ladies and gentlemen. We're living in a good country. And providing the opportunity for our children to grow and become productive citizens, there's no greater work that we can do. Minister Baldo Ramos Garcia said that the project is expected to be finished by the end of the year. The family of a Santander sugar refinery employee who died at the site has questions about what exactly happened. 34-year-old Khalil Hewlett of Teakettle Village, Cayo District, was working near the conveyor belt on Saturday when he apparently slipped and hit his head, resulting in his death. Hewlett's aunt, Shermadine Hewlett, says that when the family arrived at the factory, they were prohibited to view and identify the body. Well, he missed the bus, apparently, he could go to work. And um, he decided that he still were going to go to work. Nevertheless, he caught a ride with his supervisor and went to work this morning. A little bit after 10, um, we got a message saying that um, he was dead at the factory and a family member need to come there and identify the body to see if it's him, you know. So we set out this morning to the sugarcane factory something there. Um, when on our way there, um, we had a little um, ups and downs passing the gate, but it was nice enough to have the, um, the company attorney was there at the same time. You know, we were all at the gate waiting to go in and um, she gave the permission that we could have followed her and went back there, you know, so we can do the body. But the thing that I am displeased about is that you, we were called to go visit view this body and when we reach on the premises, um, we were told that we cannot see the body there. Why were we called to go view the body to see if, if that's our nephew? And then when we reach there, we have no access to view the body on uh, uh, the nature of the situation, that he, the position he was in. Hewlett added that they were not properly informed about her nephew's death and what exactly happened. Um, we've been having mixed um, questions about what happened. You know, uh, one spell we're hearing that uh, fan belt uh, burst and hit him. Then we secondly we hear he fell off a ledge and licked his face. So basically we don't really know what happened. So that's the question, where the question lies. What exactly happened? How he got his death? That's what we want to know. Reach out to our lawyer and then have our lawyer reach out to the company and then we we'll go, we'll go from there. We really want to know what happened exactly. Were he hit by a fan belt or did he fall from off a ledge? That's where the question lies. The latest incident marks the second fatality at the refinery this year. In February, 53-year-old Anastasio Vasquez was crushed to death by a falling steel cage. Efforts were made to revive or to receive a statement from the company, but our efforts were futile. The Cari Preserve Road in Punta Gorda is almost completed and will see the road being used as the alt alternate route to access the town proper. Works are currently underway on the Diversion Road as well as in the area of the Joe Taylor Bridge. Mayor Carlos Galvez is anticipating that the pedestrian crossing at the Joe Taylor Bridge should be in place by the end of the month. He emphasized that the crossing would be for small vehicles while the larger trucks would be required to use the alternate road. We're looking at a two to three weeks time frame for the BWS to uh, remove the existing water line that feeds Hopeville, the community, and uh, they are going to replace or reinstall that major line onto the floating barge as soon as the barge is in place. The barge is going to accommodate smaller vehicles, SUVs, pickups, so again, all the freight liners, all these uh, um, trucks that bring in well, the tankers and, and bring in um, grapes for quality poultry, those trucks won't be able to, to, to pass, no? Um, they will have to use the alternative route, which is the carrier reserve route. 
Mayor Galvez told Love News that the entire project is a double home run as it is providing an alternate road that will continue being useful even after the installation of the new bridge. This, this road, and I always have to give kudos and thanks to Minister Junos and um, CEO Victor Espat. I mean, they have great help. Uh, you know, the people of PJ, you get almost three for the price of one. So you get a new Joe Taylor Bridge, you get a new uh, road that could accommodate those in the Joe Taylor uh, area, Joe Taylor Creek area, and then you got the new uh, um, maintain, upgraded Carib Reserve Road that will accommodate all these trucks um, coming into PG. So almost three things uh, you are accomplishing by just the major project, which is the Taylor Bridge. But I'm glad, I'm glad that a lot of them get the opportunity to, to cover this because, you know, I can always say, it's best you have responsible journalism and, and uh, the, the, the idea is not to mislead the residents, you know, and, and take false information and then you spread it. And it becomes wildfire. Facts, facts is facts. The replacement of the Joe Taylor Bridge will take an estimated 12 months. The Hawksworth Bridge in San Ignacio, Santa Elena, will be closing for six months for maintenance. The announcement came this morning from the Ministry of Infrastructure Development, indicating that the closure will be from May 2 through to, to November 2. It is a temporary closure that will allow the ministry to conduct critical maintenance and repairs to the structural elements on the deck and walkway. Love News understands that apart from the repairs, the ministry will also be improving on the support structure of the bridge. In the interim, the Macau Bridge will be used to facilitate motorists entering and exiting the Twin Towns. We have more news for you ahead, including a look at cases from the Magistrates Court in the Old Capitol. This is Love Lab at 6. We'll be back. Stay with us.
And we welcome you back to Love Live at 6. The National Forensic Science Services, or Service, NFSS, is working to establish an in-country deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA testing database. The NFSS has embarked on the journey, which includes implementing several legislation and training sessions. Today, the organization embarked on the first phase of its population study by collecting gene samples from volunteers to calculate, to calculate frequency statistics from their genetic profiles. The event was held at the University of Belize's campus in Belmopan and was geared toward collecting as many samples as possible. NFSS direct, uh, Executive Director Jian Cho spoke about the purpose of the venture and how it will impact the way authorities fight crime. When somebody commits a crime um, or becomes a victim of a crime and we need DNA evidence, the sample that we take from either the victim or the suspect, we extract a DNA profile and we study that profile based or to, to search for certain markers within the, the DNA, the, per, the individual's uh, genetic profile. Um, as you would know, the, the human genome consists of billions of base pairs, three billion base pairs to be exact. We forensics, the forensic science community, only looks for about 20, a little bit over 20 specific markers. We call them short tandem repeats, STR markers. They have no impact on, or no known impact on any medical diagnosis, on any ancestry. It's a different part of your genes that determine your, or that indicate your ancestry or your medical profile. Right, so what we're looking for are the allele frequencies at those, what we call loci. I know I'm using a lot of technical term, but it's the loci that, that um, have the STR markers that we're studying. And we want to see the frequency of the particular uh, genotypes at those markers within the Belizean population so that when we send or when we test for DNA, currently we, the labs that we use in the USA, they have an African-American um, genetic um, database or a Hispanic database or an Asian-American database that we would tell them, all right, the, the individual from which this genetic profile came from, we want you to compare it to one of those databases to do the necessary calculation of what, what things like likelihood ratio or what, are, what is known as random match probability or those things like that, right? So, but we don't have anything that is Belizean. And you know our Belizean population is a little bit different than, than other populations in terms of the, the variety of ethnic groups. So this research is trying to study whether there's a, a particular um, characteristic or, or uniqueness of our population based on these ethnic groups. So we're, we're applying a different lens rather than just saying the entire Belizean population. We're breaking it down into ethnic groups to see if there's any significant difference in the frequency of these STR markers across those uh, ethnic groups. It was the second event held by the NFSS. The entity recently held a similar initiative at a military base and plans to hold a drive in Belize City. Shaw says the NFSS has so far not been able to garner much support and explained that it is important for Belizeans to take part in the study. This morning alone, within the first hour, we got uh, just under 10. Um, while we are at BDF, we barely got 10 in one day. Um, but it, it indicates the, the, the hesitance of the Belizean culture to participate in research. Um, perhaps it's a lack of understanding of what these types of studies are about. It's, I mean, in other countries, these types of population studies occur very frequently. You can even think of this as a census of the Belizean population genome. We're trying to just see how often certain features appear within the, the, the population. It's anonymous, right? Um, and yeah, the, the information won't be stored in any way. It's not fed into any criminal database. But these are some key points that members of the public might, might be, you know, um, might form a barrier for them to actually come forward and donate. We're at an academic institution, place of learning, has studies, a lot of scientific stuff happening on this campus. So it's not surprising that we're getting more turnout. And that's why we were strategic. Um, we selected the military because it's right next to our forensic lab, because it's supposed to be made up from people across Belize. Same with the University of Belize, cross-section the Belizean population. Same with SJC, cross-section and Belizean population. So we, we selected the academic institutions for that purpose. 
but also because this is where research happens. So hopefully we get people that, like these gentlemen over here, hopefully they are, they are interested to come find out more. Aiming for a minimum of 800 samples. The last time a study was done like this, they only got a little over 200 samples, which uh, the, the, the greater the sample size, the more reliable study. We're aiming for a minimum of 800. We're far away from the area. So whatever support uh, the public can come out, it takes less than 10 minutes. It's not painful, it's painless. You did it, uh, you see how easy it is. Again, it's, it's anonymous. Um, if we don't, after the three sample collection days, we don't meet the minimum 800, we'll have to do some more. Cho says the study will take an estimated one year and a half to complete. The Rotary Club of Belize is teaming up with the Rotary Club of Port Moody in British Columbia, Canada to enhance education in 11 target schools in the Belize district. Through a collaboration with funding from the Rotary Global Grant, computer labs will be set up in the schools for them to access websites within the remote area community hotspots for education and learning. That's the Rachel Saf software. The project seeks to combat education loss incurred by students due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Principals and teachers from the target schools have begun attending workshops on using the software. Today, Glenn Brown from the Rotary Club of Port Moody and Catherine Main, president of the Rotary Club of Belize, explain the collaboration between the clubs and the Ministry of Education and how the project will impact the lives of students. First of all, it's essentially an offline server, so it brings the internet to a place where maybe there's no internet. And in addition to that co uh, content, it has applications that support learning, like learning management systems that help teachers organize lesson plans in the, in the classroom. So a major focus of Rotary is literacy, and Rachel has content that really focuses on gains in, in literacy and basic education. But it does a couple of other things. It, it introduces educational technology and uh, helps develop digital literacy in the classroom. And it also works with students in terms of more modern approaches to learning. When we think about 21st century learning, which emphasize things like creativity, inquiry, consultation, communication, collaboration, teamwork. These are really different ways of learning than what happened 20 years ago. The, the infrastructure is actually relatively simple. Rachel's servers themselves are relatively inexpensive. They're about $500 US and they will support 20 or 30 a classroom full of Chromebooks. So for a classroom we're providing the Rachel server 20 or 30 Chromebooks and some of the ancillary equipment that they might need. So it's not only textbooks, it's also the applications that are there. One really cool example is we had a pilot project with um, St. Martin de Porres and one of the kids from St. Martin de Porres actually learned how to build a robot from one of the applications that they were able to utilize. And it's, there's a digital angle too because they, we also offer on the program coding and we know how important te technology and the interest in technology and science and math and literature all is. And to be able to have these devices that can constantly be updated in terms of the type of curriculum, it really opens the horizon so much bigger because it's not limited to what that textbook has. It's the sky's the limit in a sense. Well, this is really a partnership. This is a partnership between the Ministry of Education. So we collaborated with the ministry to be able to identify the schools most in need because that's always the question how do we narrow down right how do we select um, in this case we were able to be able to get funding and this is a nice project it's 210,000 Belize dollars in value um, and that includes the devices and Chromebooks headsets and also some additional tools and support for the schools themselves that go that's going to be given out over the next few weeks and months um, but ultimately we worked with the ministry to be able to identify schools we identified some in Belize Rural and we also identified some in Belize City as well. We also spoke with Ardeth Kelly, Principal of Belize Rural Primary School and Janine St. Bernard, Principal of Lucky Strike Government School about their experiences in the training and how it will change the way learning happens in their respective schools. The training is introducing us to the Rachel program and is teaching us how to maneuver the um, program and the resources that they have so that we can take it back and introduce it to our teachers and so that they can use it in teaching and learning and lesson planning. So I am excited to take it back 
to our school because I know, I'm confident that it will enhance learning in the classroom. Um, there are areas with literacy, literacy and numeracy that um, the resources that are provided by this program, it's um, various, there are various resources that can be used in math, language arts, science, Belizean studies, all subject areas. I am really excited to take this program back to our school because it coincides with the curriculum that we are presently using. For example, one of the things that stood out here for us this over the past two days is the problem-based learning. It is something that we have been doing, but Rachel will allow us to give our children more exposure to material that they can utilize on their own, let them explore, let them see things for themselves without being afraid of them going on the internet or having any restrictions. They include Biscayne Government School, Belize Rural Primary, Lucky Strike Government Primary School, St. Agnes Anglican Primary, Crooked Tree Government Primary School, Unity Presbyterian School, Salvation Army, St. Luke Primary School, St. Ignatius RC School, St. John Anglican Primary School, and Stella Maris School. Maine added that Stella Maris was a special addition to the list and that the school was originally founded by Rotarians. In just three days, Belize will have a new beauty ambassador, the prestigious Miss Universe Belize. Ten delegates will strut the runway at the Belize City Civic Center on Saturday night as they compete for the title. Miss Universe is a competition for all kinds of women to champion causes, platform advocacies, and break barriers. It's something these queens from this year will aspire to achieve as they proudly break barriers for women in pageant. Kendra Romero reports. The 2024 delegates for Miss Universe Belize are committed to paving the way for inclusivity and showing that beauty knows no bounds. For the first time, the prestigious Miss Universe Belize pageant welcomes not only one, but two mothers, several women over the age of 28, and a married woman. National Director for Miss Universe Belize, Destiny Arnold, says she is thrilled to celebrate women in all forms. Um, we often see the controversies um, spurred across Facebook and Instagram and so on. So we really needed to shift the perspective of pageantry in Belize and um, make sure that the community knew that we were in foundation of standards of integrity and um, really build those partnerships. And it was tough, but I am very thankful that we have been successful in turning that perspective around and have partnered with some amazing entities across Belize. So we are finally in the arena where we are celebrating the woman in all her forms. Um, so we are really touching all bases and making sure that we are in an inclusive organization as a whole. The delegates include Michaela Gungara, Vivian Norales, Myra Sabrian, Fanny Mejia, Jasmine Ramdas, Halima Hoy, Mariam Abdul Kawi, Shaina Gilhari, and Monali Aspinal. Jasmine, a proud mother of one, hopes to use her platform to inspire other mothers. Uh, giving birth to my, my daughter in 2017, and when they lifted the restrictions and allowing mothers to enter the pageant, I was so excited. I, I was running up and down the room, and I told my mother, <laughs> this is my time. This is my time to shine. Yeah. Yes, of course, I want to win the crown. But it's not all about winning for me. It's about just being an example and leading, letting them know that we can do this as mothers. It's not anything out there that we can't do. Not because we're mothers or we're thicker. That means we can't pursue our dreams. Dreams and success come in all different shapes and form. So mothers, remember me when Jasmine Jael Ramda said this. You are beautiful inside out and we are super women. Previously, the organization only allowed single women aged between 18 and 28 who have never been married nor had children. In 2022, however, those restrictions were lifted. Fanny Mejia told us her reaction when she heard the news. You know, God got me through some really dark times in my life and you know, I'm here now in Miss Universe Belize, you know. <laughs> Like when the age restriction was lifted and when mothers were allowed to compete, you know, God put it in my heart to apply. At that moment in my life, I was like, 
I'm not ready. <laughs> but you know, it just weighed heavy on me. And I finally applied. And when I applied, I would ask God, just give me the words to put on this paper. And he did. And I was like, if this is not for me, don't let me get accepted. But you know, here I am today. Um, God has given me the gift of health care. And you know that sometimes you don't see what goes on behind closed doors. You know, people are suffering, they have health care issues, and I just want to use my gift of health care to not only give them a better life here on earth, but also impact them for eternity. 29-year-old Halima Hoy is a married woman born and raised on the south side of Belize City. She encourages people to follow their dreams. My journey here is 100% genuine, and I don't like to think about it as my journey. It's our journey, because that title means that I'm representing the entire country, and I take that very seriously. But I am a woman who have overcome adversity in the community where I grew up, and I can write a book on all the adversities that I have overcome. But who hasn't? We've all overcame adversities. But we have to consider this. What are we going to do with those adversities? Are we going to let that exp those experiences keep us in the mud? Or are we going to reshape it and make it empower us? And once we're empowered, what are we going to do with that information? We're going to translate it to the world. We want everybody to know that we all have struggles, but we can always rise above. I'm here. I've been happily married for six years, which is a great accomplishment. And I'm also pursuing my bachelor's degree in allied health. And those are things that I never imagined I can get because of where I grew up and the economics, socioeconomic circumstances that I was in. But I want you guys to know that it's possible to chase your wildest dream. And in terms of healthy beliefs, I'm just going to leave you with this. We don't grow old and slow down. We slow down and grow old. So keep moving, Belize. As the women prepare for the Miss Universe Belize pageant on Saturday, we celebrate them all for pursuing their dreams, shattering stereotypes, and embracing limitless potential within themselves. Reporting for Love News, I am Kendra Romero. If you had seen the morning show today, you would have noted that there were only nine contestants for the Miss Universe Belize pageant, the 10th candidate. Maya Liss Wright has, was briefly disqualified from the pageant committee. Wright had gotten the Glenn Godfrey Law Firm involved and was able to get reinstated as an official contestant today. Love News understands that Wright did not show up for the registration event and as such was disqualified. In a letter from the Miss Universe Committee, they cited the need for professionalism and ultimately decided to give Wright a second chance to register tomorrow. Miss Universe Belize 2024 has revealed a one-of-a-kind glass crown to be worn by this year's pageant winner. The glass crown was created by Inga Woods Waite, who is an engineer student, glass blower, and was inspired from Belize's national flower, the Black Orchid. National Director at Miss Universe Belize, Destiny Arnold, says this is the first crown that represents Belize's culture. Yes, the crown is actually made of glass. And I want to go ahead and thank Miss Inga Woods Waite because she um, used her, her craft and her creativity, her talent to really um, bring in our black orchid crown and bring it to life. Um, it is celebrating all things Belizean because what's more Belizean than our national flower? And um, the fact that there is no other country that I know of that even has a glass crown <laughs> or of course has a black orchid gl glass crown specifically and it will be worn by our title holder for at least three years um, and we will cycle it out but um, our crown can be expected to always be all things Belizean. I.F. Wade of Sacred Heart College was the British High Commissioner for a day. Wade was the winner of the high school competition hosted by the Commission. British High Commissioner, Her Excellency Nicole Davison, explained that the competition was aimed at exposing the winning student to diplomacy and the work of the Commission. Davison stressed that Wade submitted the winning video pitch, but on the job, she exceeded expectations. 
Basically, we decided that we wanted to give a young girl the opportunity to see what it was like to do my job for a day. Um, that was really based on the fact that diplomacy can be a little bit of an unknown entity and it's not always clear what high commissions and embassies do. So we opened up the competition and we asked a young girl to send in a video um, basically answering the question, if you were high commissioner for a day, what would your priorities be and what would you do to advance diversity and inclusion? Well, the first thing I'd say is no two days are ever the same. Every day is different. Uh, it depends a little bit on... Um, whether we have events going on or whether we have people visiting from the UK or um, whether we're working on any projects but in essence um, the work that we do is a lot around climate project funding um, we do a lot of work around gender and diversity there's a lot of bilateral work you know sort of promoting UK Belize relations um, and we're also a small mission so we have to be quite uh, targeted in what we do as well so no two days are ever alike in essence I think today's given us quite a good model what we did was set up a day of kind of meetings with the kind of people that we normally engage with but we also tailored it to what we thought IFA's interests were and then we culminated in a reception here at the British High Commission residence where IFA can then uh, basically meet a whole bunch of women who are real trailblazers so I think it's given us a good model so I'm hopeful and my team won't kill me, that we'll be able to do it again next year, make an annual thing and start to build up an alumni. Wade credits her teachers at Sacred Heart for entering and winning the competition. She walked us through her packed day of meetings as High Commissioner for a day. My teacher pulled me out of my classroom as she told me, okay, the Students Affairs Administration recommended you for this competition and I think you would be perfect for it because you have this spark that not all students have and I was like, I'm not sure if this is something that I want to do, but she continued to encourage me and I applied even though I submitted like pretty last minute, like I may procrastinate it pretty bad to be honest. But here I am and I ended up winning, so it's thanks to Mr. Foni that I'm here and Miss Usher of course. I started off bright early, we up 5.30 and I traveled from Sainasia to Belmopan. I met with the security officer, he gave me a briefing of everything that goes on in the um, High Commission. And then I met with the special envoy in the UK, uh, Miss Alicia Herbert. We had a chat about her role in gender-based violence and stuff like that. And then afterwards, I went to the Ministry of Education and I met with the CEO, Miss Diane, and she also gave me a talk, uh, a talk. And after that, I went back to the High Commission and I met with the staff. I learned about the commission, their mission, because they're pretty small, but it's a pretty diverse group of people. They have climate change, security, transport. It's a big group and they're all incredible. Then afterwards, we went to the Governor General's house and I had a talk with Her Excellency. After that, we went straight to Wings on Feathers to meet with the Speaker of the House, Miss Valerie Woods. And after that, back to the High Commission again, and I met with the retired Ambassador, Miss uh, Vianne Hyde. And then I made my way over here, and I'm here now. High Commissions carry the same function as embassies within Commonwealth countries, with the High Commissioner fulfilling the role of Ambassador. A man has been sent to jail after being accused of pushing his nephew down a flight of stairs. 31-year-old Esau Bainton appeared unrepresented before Chief Magistrate Jayani Wegadopola, where he was charged with wounding. The charge stemmed from a police report that a woman and her 12-year-old son made to police or the police department on March 28. According to the report, the 12-year-old boy was at his grandmother's house when his uncle told him to get out of the house. As he was about to leave, Bainton allegedly pushed him down the stairs. In court, Bainton pleaded guilty but explained that he did not push his nephew. He simply tapped him and that's when he slipped and fell down the stairs. He added that he told his nephew to go outside since they were making a lot of noise. In court, the chief magistrate told Bainton that she was unable to grant him bail due to his old $700 court fine. Bainton was sentenced to one month imprisonment. Two men walked from the murder charge of Gilbert Mohammed Martinez Jr. 26-year-old Floyd Wade and Clifton Percival Robinson appeared before Justice Derek Sylvester in court today where they were jointly charged for the 2021 murder of Martinez Jr. In court, the Director of Public Prosecutions chose to discontinue the case since the police department could not locate the Crown's main witness to testify in the trial against the men. Martinez's body was found bounded, gagged and tied up 
up in the Belama Phase 4 area in the drain near his home. While the men were free of Martinez's murder, Wade and Robinson remained behind bars pending two other outstanding cases. Wade had an arson case pending trial and Robinson has a charge of attempted murder pending. Belize City Customs broker fined after alleged 127 gram of marijuana drug bust. 20-year-old Keon Strotter appeared unrepresented before a magistrate in court where he was read a single charge of possession of a controlled drug with intent to supply. Strotter pleaded guilty and was fined with $150 plus $5 cost of court, which he was given until May 31 to pay in default up to one week imprisonment. Southside Belize City resident is out on bail after failing to sign in at a police station for being a member of a gang. 24-year-old Sean Anthony Humes appeared unrepresented before a senior magistrate in court where he was read a single charge of contempt of judicial order. According to police report, Humes was offered bail on February 5 for being a member of a gang and was ordered to the, by the court to report to a designated police station once a week, which he did not adhere to. Humes pleaded guilty and was fined $200 plus a $5 cost of court fine, which he was ordered to pay by May 21, in default two months imprisonment. You're watching Love Live at 6. The news continues after the break. Stay right where you are.
And we welcome you back to our final segment of news for tonight. The Ministry of Health and Wellness is on a countrywide campaign talking to various partners about Pink Eye. The Ministry, through the Health Education and Community Participation Bureau, or HECOPAB, is hosting information sessions with schools and organizations as part of routine awareness activities. The Ministry explains that Pink Eye is one of several communicable diseases illnesses that are prevalent this time of year due to the weather. Love News caught up with the ministry's team in Orange Walk earlier today to learn more about the ongoing campaign. Beatrice Gangara, public health worker with the ministry, explained that Pink Eye, or what Pink Eye is and what can be done to help fight the spread. Okay, Pink Eye is also known as the conjunctivitis. It's scientifically known as conjunctivitis. Pink eye is the inflammation of the membrane that we have in our eye. It's, it gets swell. Okay, some causes of the pink eye, it, it's by um, virus or bacteria that we can find in dirty clothes, cosmetics, or contact lenses. Some signs of symptoms of the pink eye is um, scratchy eye, burning of the eye, um, grainy feeling in the eye and also watery eye wa um, some liquid um pus in the eye and also the um the light it hurts our eye that's also a symptom of the pink eye okay if you have pink eye you you need to visit your doctor you cannot go outside and buy uh eye drop for your eye no you need to visit your doctor to recommend you the proper um eye drop for your eye how we can prevent this? The main one is by washing our hands properly. We need to wash our hands properly and adequately so our hands are clean. Okay. If we have kids at school or at high school, please don't send them to school because this pink eye is very contagious and we need to stop this. If we stop sending our kids, if they are sick, this will prevent us from getting a large number of contagious people. One of the most important ways to fight the spread of pink eye is proper hand washing. Marisa Alamia, visual aids officer at the Northern Regional Hospital, gave a demonstration of proper hand washing techniques. The proper way of hand washing is first we have to wet our hands, then we apply the soap. Then we have to rub our hands like this, we need to make a lot of bubbles because germs are being trapped inside of the bubbles. Then we have to wash the back of our hands, then between our fingers. Then we need to wash our fingernails because germs love to live on our fingernails. And we need to wash it like this. Then we need to wash our thumbs. Then we need to wash our wrists. When we finish, now we can dry our hands using a clean towel. If we do not have a clean towel, we can do like this until it is dry. Please do not dry your hands on your clothes because remember our clothes contains germs. The ministry is also carrying on a social media campaign, uploading vital information to its various pages. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food Security and Enterprise is excited to announce the activities included in the 52 National Ag or the 52nd National Agriculture and Trade Show, which will be held from Friday to Sunday, April 26 to 28, at the National Agriculture and Trade Show grounds in Belmopan. Andrew Mejia, a livestock coordinator at the Ministry of Agriculture, Food Security and Enterprise, says that this year's event is expected to be bigger and better than ever. As usual, the show promises to be bigger and better. Um, over the years, we have brought up the agriculture aspect of it. It was leading more towards trade over the years. But this year, um, as usual, we're, we're coming. We will have displays in terms of crops, vegetables, fruit trees, what our processing, our, um, our tilapia hatchery will be there, our livestock will be there, the road will be bigger. This year, we're also having the harsh race, promising to be exciting harsh race. So we have a lot of activities coming up. 
Um, it's the 26th, 27th, and 28th. I'd like to encourage Belizeans to come out, bring your families. You know, have, it's a family event. Come and have fun and 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 um, enjoy the show. The show is designed for for that weekend to be family oriented. I know sometimes it's hard to go out as a family, but on that day, come out. You know. The theme for this year's show will be held under the theme Innovations in Technology, Driving a Climate Resilient and Competitive Agriculture and Food Sector. This has been Love Live at 6. I'm Tamar Jones. Another edition of the News on Love TV can be viewed tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. With that, we want to say thank you for watching and we wish you a good night. Good evening. Generally fair, warm and windy conditions prevail. The 24-hour forecast. Skies will be clear to partly cloudy tonight and then sunny with a few cloudy spells tomorrow. Little or no rainfall is expected for tonight and tomorrow morning. Then a few showers or isolated thunderstorms will develop over inland areas. Low temperatures for tonight will reach around 82 degrees Fahrenheit along the coast, 75 degrees Fahrenheit inland, and 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the mountains. High temperatures for tomorrow will reach around 90 degrees Fahrenheit along the coast, 94 degrees Fahrenheit inland, and 88 degrees Fahrenheit in the hills. Winds over the open sea will be from the east to southeast at 15 to 25 knots, and sea conditions will be rough. So please note that a small craft warning for gusty winds and rough seas is in effect and mariners are advised to remain in safe harbor. High tides occur at 12.05 tomorrow morning and then at 11.14. Low tides at 5.18 tomorrow morning and then at 6.46 tomorrow evening. The moon will set at 8.23 tonight and rise at 7.50 tomorrow morning. The sun set at 6.08 this evening and will rise at 5.39 tomorrow morning. The extended forecast. A few showers and isolated thunderstorms will affect most places on Thursday night. Then a few showers or light rain and isolated thunderstorms will linger along the coast and some northern and central areas on Friday. The sargasm update. The risk of sargasm affecting beaches across the country has been increased to medium as the latest satellite imagery show more mats approaching the area. And this has been this evening's weather report from the National Meteorological Service. Collins.